Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. It is a beautiful morning, and we certainly appreciate all of you being here in person and all of you that are joining us online this morning. My name is David Donovan. I'm the minister of music here at the church, and it's my privilege to gather us together in song as we continue our Easter celebration. Easter goes for 50 days, and so we are still in the Easter mode of celebrating, and we certainly are glad you are here. So we're going to start our time of worship this morning with an old familiar hymn entitled, He Lives. So let's stand. The words will be up on the screens. You can turn to number 310 in the hymnal. This is He Lives. One, two, three. second song is one we all know and love, In Christ Alone, by Keith Getty and Stuart Townend. In Christ Alone. Christ alone, my hope is mine. 
Let's pray. Gracious God, it is a beautiful, beautiful morning, and we thank you for blessing us as we have entered your house this day. Help us to continue to be the Easter people. Help us to continue to spread your love and your good news of eternal life in the days and in the weeks ahead. We lift before you those concerns that are on our hearts and on our minds, and as we see the earth continue to renew itself around us, may it be a sign, a symbol of our renewed love and commitment to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, please be seated. Our anthem this morning is entitled, Rise Again. This is one of those ones that I have known for years and years and years, and it holds a very special place in my heart. Go ahead. 
beautiful song, David. Thank you so much. <coughs> Excuse me. Whoa, that was really loud. Probably. <laughs> Forgive me for that. I got a, while I was down there, a saliva went down my throat and I got choked. You guys want to come up and talk to me for a minute? I know Pastor John's not here, but I'd love to talk to you for a second. All right? Come on down, as they say. All right. Hope you all had a great Easter and all that good stuff. But, you know, those of you that are joining online, I hope you'll come around the screen, too, as we gather together for a time of children's sermon. Uh, Now, I know Pastor John's not here, right? What does he do every time, though? Yeah, he says good morning. I don't know if he yells it, but he says it really loud, okay? So let's say it, and maybe he will hear us wherever he is, okay? Are you ready? Good morning! All right. And Easter, too. All right, happy Easter. Now, I've got a little jar of water here, right? Do you think this paper clip would float if I put it in the water? Oh, you put it on a fork and it floats. Let's see, let's see if this one goes down there. Whoop, didn't float. I have a trick, though, with a piece of paper. Maybe it's a different trick. See, put my little piece of paper in there, right? And here's a paper clip that's just the same. Huh, it did stay on top, didn't it? The tissue helped hold it up, didn't it? Now, when they read about this, it said that tissue would float to the bottom and it would stay floating, but it didn't work. So what do I know? I just looked at the thing I had. But the thing is, sometimes when people say that they're going to do something, we want to see it before we believe it, right? If they say, oh, this will happen, you say, well, I want to see it. But do you know that happened? You don't believe what? Don't believe you just watch, right? Well, the thing is, right after Jesus rose from the grave, that very evening he appeared to his disciples. And he came in and he said, my peace I give you. And he said that to them. But one of them wasn't there. His name was Thomas. And when he came back and they said, look, Thomas, Jesus came and he's risen from the dead. And he came and and came into the room with us. He said, I don't know. I'm not sure I believe that unless I see it with my own eyes. And then sure enough, a week later, Jesus came back. And he came to Thomas and he said, Thomas, see, here's the holes in my hand and the spot in my side where I was crucified. And Thomas said, oh, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe now. But you know what Jesus said after he said that? He said, you know, Thomas, blessed are those who believe even though they don't see. And, you know, that's the same with most of us. I haven't had Jesus walk through the walls of my office or anything like that. I don't often see him in that way. But I do believe, right? And we believe because he's with us and we feel his presence and we know he's here even if we can't see it with our eyes, right? Yeah. So the thing is, let us always remember, even though my trick's a little funky and maybe didn't work the way I wanted it, we always know that Jesus is here even if we can't see him. Right? Okay. Why don't you pray with me, all right? Loving God, we thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. And even if I can't see him, I can feel him. And I know he's here. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Now, I think uh, Mr. Mrs. Hill, Susan, and David are going to take you up for children's church. Maybe you'll learn a little bit more about Thomas. I'm not sure. Okay? Thank you. All right. Well, it's good to see all of you all out here today. It's good to see those of you online. Again, I'm, I'm Pastor Jay. and lead pastor here. I didn't introduce myself because I jumped right into the, the children's moment. But I wanted to make sure I got to talk to those young ones there. I don't get to see them all the time. And John usually gets to do that. I do want to call your attention to a couple of announcements. Those of you that are here in the centrum, uh, it's in this little folder that you get. To, we call it the trifold. Uh, those of you online can download that at ccumwv.org, uh, where you'll find our bulletin and also this, uh, um, you know, this trifold information about things coming up. Uh, one of the things I really want to lift up to you is next Sunday is a very special Sunday. Now, we'll gather for our 845 service here and we'll worship together. But at our 11 o'clock service, our confirmands, 
uh, those who have been going through confirmation class will be joining the church. So again, if, even if you can't come to the 11 o'clock service, I hope you come to the 845, but also recognize that our new members will be joining uh, at our 11 o'clock service. And we invite you to, of course, be a part of that. It promises to be a wonderful celebration. Also, right after this, during our Connections Hour, if you want to be a part of that, we don't have all of our classes meeting right now. Some of them ended at Easter, and they're going to be picking up some new ones, but I know they'll be uh, putting together the backpack ministry, and so Lenore Twill's here, and that'll be happening up in the Benson Epps classroom. I can direct you to that if you don't know where it is. Also, I know some folks may gather in the chapel for some time of sharing, and then at 10.30 in the chapel, I will be there to share the Sacrament of Communion. So if you want to have communion this morning, you can at 10.30 uh, in the chapel. And as always, Lord Bibby's out there with some coffee and some time for fellowship and, and growing closer to one another. The other thing you'll notice in your bulletin is there's a celebration of missions event, which is part of our uh, connection here as United Methodists. We've been doing that for many, many years. Uh, this year, they're collecting a special offering for our various mission projects, and you'll see a list of those that are in there. Our mission projects meet many needs throughout our state. Uh, there's one, of course, in South Charleston that's very close to us, Heart and Hand House. But there are others scattered all over the sa state, and your giving to that will, of course, help them uh, in their work. And one other announcement I need to make, those of you that are here at 845, you know, this, this doesn't happen uh, by itself. We have volunteers that help us put this service on. Uh, and one of the things we have a need for during the month of May, uh, John's Lee, who's up there, you can barely see, she's a short lady, sometimes you can't see her up there, but she runs our PowerPoint. Uh, and she just, she's going to be gone. You're going to be going back to India, right, see some of your family? Yes, that's what I was thinking. And so uh, she won't be here, so we really need some help in running the PowerPoint. So if you think you might be willing to do that, you know, let us know, we can train you. It's not real hard, it's basically pushing buttons and, and moving the slides forward. But we, you know, we, we're going to need some help during the month of May for that. So I invite you to... Uh, you know, if you'd like to help us that, please let us know. You also see several other items in there uh, that are coming up, special Sundays and things like that. Uh, but one of the things, of course, is on our hearts and minds as we gather uh, are those needs around us. Uh, those whom we love that are going through difficulties, problems in our world, things that are beyond our ability to address on our own. Those things that we take to the Lord in prayer. So I invite you now, again, those of you that are here, if you have a prayer concern, to you know, just let me shout it out or what have you. Those online, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll compile those and send them out to our congregation so we can all be in prayer for one another. So are there any prayer concerns that you all have uh, here in our midst today? Yes, Lenore. Okay, so it's Bob's Aunt Karen Bell. Is that right? Okay. Had surgery. Uh, any others? Yes. Patrick Tate got married, so a celebration, amen. Others? All right. Well, as we join together in our prayer chorus, I'll light our prayer candle and lead us in a time of prayer together. And Chris, if you would, as we sing this prayer chorus, bring the offering forward for us and, and place it on our altar table. Let's all sing this chorus. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus.
holy living God, like Thomas long ago, we, we want to see you. We want to see you with our own eyes. We want to know you. We want to experience your power anew in our hearts. And so as we come today, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts to all that you have to offer us. As we continue to live into this wondrous season of Easter, remembering anew that promise of your resurrection and your power over sin and death, all of those things that hold us and bind us. Oh God, we pray for that renewed release in our lives today. We come before you with those things we carry with us. For we each have our own knapsack of things that we've done or not done, left undone. Those times when we've not lived fully into your call of the kingdom. And so we come asking your forgiveness for those times when we've not opened our eyes and our hearts to your grace. And we ask that you would forgive us for that today. For we know that you are a God of forgiveness, a God of new life and new hope. And so we claim that today, both for ourselves and all those whom we love. We pray especially for those who are recovering from surgeries and others in the hospitals and those who have lost loved ones and are in mourning. We pray for your resurrection presence to be with them renewing them and giving them life so that they might see that hope and that strength that they need. We pray also for the various issues around our globe, especially in the Ukraine where that war still rages, and we pray for peace there, O oh God. We pray for your presence to manifest there so that they might open their eyes and, and see the way to peace, that they might open their ears to your word of hope and strength. And bring an end to this senseless conflict and all the death that goes with it. We pray that you would act there, O oh God, in a very special and powerful way. We also pray, O oh God, that you'd act here in our community, bringing us new life, showing us the way to, to bring hope to the world and the community around us. As we think of our neighbors who are homeless, others who are hungry. Help us, O oh God, to be your hands in seeking to serve them and bring your presence into their lives. And we ask all of this today in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Christ, the one who was risen, the one who showed his disciples his hands, his feet, and the one who invites us to pray whenever we gather, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Our lesson today comes to us from the Gospel of John. We're continuing with John in the resurrection narratives we find in the 20th chapter there. Uh, I'll be reading from verse 19 to verse 31. It says, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, 
and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to them, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, as we gather on this beautiful morning, I I pray as always that these words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you ever and always are our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Who really shot JFK? Were the moon landings real or staged? Did Elvis really die in 1977, or did he fake his death in order to get some privacy? Was 9-11 staged by the United States government? You know, here in our country, we seem to love a conspiracy story, don't we? We seem to have a weakness for this, and and it seems to be actually almost embedded in our history as a people and as a nation from the very beginning. Some historians speculate that the founding fathers were in many ways moved to to write the Declaration of Independence because they believed that, that Britain was about to enslave all of the colonists. And the idea that there is somehow some shadowy, mysterious person or group or or force that's pulling all the strings behind the scenes in our history has been almost a constant theme for theorists who believe these things are not as they appear. There are many examples, the the black helicopters, the the Illuminati, uh, Roswell mystery, and people always seem to think that there's something rotten in Denmark or Des Moines or Dallas or even Jerusalem. It's almost as if doubting the veracity of what we see and hear is is just normal. Whenever we encounter something that is out of the ordinary or challenging to our understanding, we question it, we doubt it, and we want to know what's behind it. And it's particularly true when this thing that we're thinking about really challenges our understanding and thinking about how the world works or is so out of the ordinary, or so mysterious that it literally boggles our mind. We want to know the truth. And today, of course, in our conspiratorial world, this thinking on the internet is kind of an unfiltered way to get all of that stuff out, right? And a lot of these people are, are called truthers, continuing to look for new information to figure out what really happened, right? And their theories, you know, get all, always go out there around events of historical significance and, and particularly deaths of famous people. And most of us usually question these conspiracy theories, as I, as I think we should. But the thing is, we always really need people who are looking for the truth. When it comes to a famous, the most famous death in history, this death of Jesus the Christ... There are lots of conspiracy theories out there that abound from the very beginning. But at the very center of the story, though, there is one disciple who's wanting to get to the truth. Thomas. We might even call him the original truther, if you will. But you know, I always found Thomas to be one of the most interesting characters in the gospel narratives. Indeed, his questioning of his fellow disciples and his wondering what happened and his questioning about that give him his most common nickname, Doubting Thomas, right? That's what we call him. Not Thomas the disciple. Not Thomas, the one who was willing to go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. Not even Thomas Didymus or Thomas the twin as he's referred to in our text. We just call him Doubting Thomas, right? And I kind of think Thomas has gotten a bad rap. 
Because truth be told, I think his response to the resurrection was probably only natural. I mean, most of us, if we were confronted with such a mysterious and baffling news as this, we would wonder and we would question what I think. You know, his, his story is a familiar one. You know, after the death of Jesus on Easter Sunday, that very night, he, he comes and he appears to the, you know, his uh, uh, disciples. They're in behind locked doors. They're afraid of the Jewish leaders. I, I've often felt like maybe this was the upper room. Maybe they went back there and they, they closed themselves in. And they'd heard that Mary Magdalene had come and said, I've seen the Lord. And they, they questioned her. They, they dismissed her kind of like it was fake news or something. Because women weren't considered reliable witnesses in that day. They couldn't testify in a court of law. And so they may have just chalked up this claim as some kind of hysteria. But then suddenly Jesus appears in that room with them. Appears with that greeting, peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands and his sides. He, he shows them the evidence that he's there. It's kind of a strange combination. You know, he, he can walk through doors, but, he, but he's got this physical body. It's really wild. It's clear that he's risen, but it's a different kind of body. It's a, but it's a body nonetheless, and the disciples rejoice in it. And Mary's testimony is vindicated. But the problem is Thomas wasn't there. Right? Thomas, who knows, maybe he'd gone to the store. I don't know where he was. But when the others tell him that they've seen the Lord, those very same words that Mary Magdalene had told them early on, Thomas is skeptical. He's not going to take this wild speculation about this thought. Not just yet. And he says, unless I see the marks in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe, he says. After all, they had had the benefit of seeing that. But he hadn't. So why shouldn't he? Maybe he was thinking they were involved in some kind of conspiracy story. I don't know. But what we do know for sure about this Thomas guy is that he was a thinker and he was a questioner. Back in John chapter 14 verse 5, and Jesus says, you you." don't know the way to where I'm going, or you you do know the way to where I'm going. He goes, well, where are you going, Jesus? He wants to know. And so he questions him. Not that he was afraid, because back in chapter 11, he's the only one that spoke up and was ready to go with Jesus into a dangerous place, even if it meant his own death. But now when he's confronted with this news, he's just not sure. And it's because he does not want to sell his own life cheaply based on some kind of wild speculation or false information, that we may call Thomas a doubter because of his question. I believe we need Thomases in our community. We need people that are are willing to push back a little bit on what maybe seems to be craziness. Because you see, Thomas isn't a doubter. Thomas simply wants the truth. Which actually is something we all should be seeking, right? Thomas doesn't reject the idea of the resurrection outright. He he just wants more evidence. He wants to know and experience it for himself. And then suddenly, of course, he gets that opportunity. Because a week later, Jesus does come and comes to them again. And when he comes, he gives the evidence that Thomas is looking for. He says, see here, put your finger in my hands, put your hand in my side. You know, it's real important to me to note that Jesus doesn't give Thomas a hard time, does he? No. He just simply comes and he shows him the truth that he was looking for. But one thing I've also found interesting when I read this text, and we all have probably heard it many, many times, is though he asked to touch the nails in his side, Thomas doesn't do it, does he? Jesus offers it to him. But Thomas doesn't take him up on the offer. Because you see, the presence of the Lord was enough. The presence of the Lord was enough to ease his doubt. The presence of Christ was all the evidence that he needed. And that presence quelled all of his doubts and fears. Because his doubt wasn't about the resurrection. 
was about the reports of it. And when he saw Jesus, he had no doubt that Jesus was alive. You know, we often say, seeing is believing. But it seems to me when Jesus comes to Thomas, he, he asks us to flip that around. Because Jesus seems to be telling them that believing is seeing. Credo et intelligam, Anselm of Canterbury put it centuries later. And that's certainly how it is with the rest of us who follow Jesus. I mean, the New Testament is full of eyewitnesses' accounts, and we can proof text that, and we can prove that Jesus was risen. But it really doesn't start there. It starts with our faith. You know, sometimes I think we read this text, and when... Jesus tells Thomas these words that it's somehow a scolding. But I think we've misread it. Maybe it's more of an observation where he pronounces a special blessing on those who believe without seeing. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. You know, it almost sounds like a beatitude, doesn't it? Blessed are you even if you have not seen. In other words, if you need to have evidence, that's fine. But you're really blessed if you believe me without it. Because you see, Jesus' statement tells us that what we ask for in our earthbound decisions about testimony and evidence and proof really isn't the currency of the kingdom of God. That thing which the writer of Hebrews describes as the evidence of things not seen. You know, C.S. Lewis famously remarked that he believed in Christianity just like he believes in the sun. And he said, I believe it not because I can see it, but because by it I can see everything else. And I think that's really the truth about faith. The light of faith, the light of a belief in Christ illuminates everything else. Brandon Ambrosino, Ambrosino, I'm not sure I can pronounce his name correctly, he covers religion and he writes for Vox.com. And I want to read his quote because it really made sense to me. He says, that's how I see Jesus' resurrection. Not so much an event I look at, but as an event I look through. For me, it remains the interpretive key to the entire universe. And though it might seem improbable and primitive, we're all aware that the idea is writ large across both our imaginations and even the cosmos. Each morning the sun is reborn, each spring harvests come back to life. After each disappointment, our dashed hopes are reanimated and soar to even newer height. For all the death and evil and greed and ugliness of our world, I can't shake the fact. That every last atom of this place is pulsing in time with the rhythm of the resurrection. That everything pulses in time with the rhythm of the resurrection. We may not be able to see the resurrection in the same way that Thomas did. But I think we can certainly see it. Because when we believe it. We see the world through it. As I was working on my sermon this week, I, I took a break. I've been working some at home, and I, I sat on the back stoop. And I looked out behind our parsonage there. and I mean, all the trees were dead. You know, spring's come pretty late this year. There were the bare, stark, dead trees and the bark and the, and the dead kudzu, which I'm glad it's dead right now, but we'll see what happens later. But I looked out and there was like all these brittle, dead-looking trees. But then back behind them there was one. One tree that had all this light green leaves on it. And I began to recognize that's like the resurrection. When I believe in it, even though it's real dark in front of me, there's that glimmer of light. That glimmer of life and hope that, that's there. Just like that tree in the background that's coming to life. It's that promise that helped my family gather this week as we remember my uncle standing there in, 
in front of that mystery of death, but able to laugh together and then sing songs that spoke of new life and hope. Because believing in the light of Christ burns all of that darkness away. And by believing, we have the, the opportunity to see that new light. Of course, some of us in our, our life of faith have that easily. Some of us struggle with it. Where others may speak of easy access to this faith, maybe you find yourself wrestling with it, saying words but doubting, perhaps because of your experiences or your your background or your training. Many of these things sometimes conspire against us when we try to believe and we encounter doubt. You know, there are many churches where if you come in and you say you doubt it, they pretty much tell you to go on and hit the road. That's not the case here. In fact, if you doubt... And to me, you care enough to wonder. And you're no different than Thomas. And if you care enough to question, if if you're concerned enough to wrestle with these questions, you're moving to what is an authentic profession of faith. And you're grounded on the path of honest reliance on God alone. Because for so many of us, this time of doubt is just one step on that journey to faith. Dorothy Day was a lady who encountered that. She's become very famous in the life of the church. But in her autobiography, The Long Journey, she described her inability to pray as she was coming to faith. She had seen so much as a young woman. She'd had a string of lovers. She had hardship as a writer and a reporter. Her education and socialist principles challenged the belief of God and everything she was reading said faith is just the opiate of the masses. But she felt herself coming to faith. But whenever she knelt to pray, she couldn't overcome her doubt, shame. She said, do I really believe what I'm praying to or whom I'm praying to? Is prayer just for the lonely and the weak? Those may be questions you ask yourself. But one time when Dorothy was walking to the village to get her mail, she found herself praying again. And this time she felt it was coming out as a a deep sense of thankfulness. And then encouraged, she continued to pray. Praying in spite of her doubts. And no matter how dull the day or how long the walk seemed to be or how sluggish she felt in the beginning, the, the words of thanksgiving that she prayed began to slowly move her heart. And she came through faith, through her doubt. And eventually giving them up and went on to form the Catholic worker movement that has done so much good in the slums of our cities and all those areas. But her path was one that had to go through that season of doubt. You know, we live this side of Easter. And though we may never be graced with seeing Jesus walk through that door and say, Hey, look at my hands, look at my feet. There is evidence of him all around us. But sometimes we got to slow down and walk through it. And begin to think about all that God has done and all that God has made possible. And then in that we begin to see that resurrected Lord in all of these things around us. In a moment we're going to be singing a song that spells out the words of the Apostles Creed. I've encountered many people in my ministry who who wrestle with that creed. They they say, I'm not sure I can say those words. I'm not sure I I believe it all. And I want to tell them that that's okay. I invite you to sing the words today, even if you don't believe it yet. Even if you're not there yet. And I say that because as I've told you here before a few years back, I remember the story of Kathleen Norris. Kathleen's husband was wrestling in the depths of depression. She'd been trying to take care of him and 
and do the things she needed to do. And she decided to go to church. And she went, and they, and they said the creed, and she said, I just, I just can't do it. But she kept going. And she said, I kept going, and every time I went, they said those words, and they, they talked about what they believed and how they understood it. And though I sat there quiet, their words carried me until I could say them again. So if you're in that place today, that's okay. Let us sing the words for you and carry you until you too can believe and then see. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jay was mentioning, this is entitled, This I Believe. It's a hill song song and Job is going to lead us through this and uh, the refrain you'll see will be up on the screen and it repeats several times. Some of you may know this from listening to it on the radio but this is This I Believe.
my sisters and brothers, let us go forth in the name of the risen one. Let us seek to see the world through the eyes of the resurrection, such that we may see his presence, such that we may know him in all we do. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.